Okay, now the next step is uh, one hour uh, about uh, OV40. Uh, and uh, as I know, uh, there will be a short talk of 12 minutes about that. And then there's time for questions and then the next talk of 12 minutes. So, yeah. The first is Andreas. Andreas is one of the head who is very famous to MCHF development and software. And Andreas uh, will start with the talk. Many thanks. These are my contributors. <laughs> the project uh, started uh, about three years ago, and I wanted uh, I want to tell you something first about the philosophy, and uh, then about the technique, the the hardware of uh, the new project. Uh, I hope it uh, will be an exciting project with uh, will aim which is aimed. Uh, to win uh, young people for our beautiful hobby uh, because of it combines uh, hardware and uh, firmware, PC and software uh, in a manner uh, that uh, can fascinate them. OVE40 uh, was started uh, about uh, one and a half years ago. Uh, first, um, I was looking uh, for an attractive uh, do-it-yourself <laughs> project because uh, I'm uh, the person in our small DARC, uh, 15 people only, it's in Zulingen, India 40, the DOK, 15 uh, members only, and uh, I'm the one who is responsible uh, for youth and for education. And so I saw uh, the project from Chris, Mike, Zero, November, Kilo, Alpha, uh, the MCHF. Um, who from you knows this project? Okay, I think um, mo more than 50%. Uh, it's a standalone uh, SDR, which uh, is uh, based on the mixing uh, and uses an uh, MCU from uh, microelectronics, the STM. Uh, 32F4 uh, and a small LCD display uh, and this all is uh, combined in a very small case and uh, he, Chris, uh, called it an inexpensive homebrew project. Uh, I saw it in the beginning uh, as a uh, project with, which, which has capabilities. Uh, as I joined it, uh, no touchscreen was working, uh, FM was not available, uh, many things which are now uh, standard on MCHF2 uh, were not present. Uh, and I had visions at this time, and uh, the first, as I joined the project, was uh, to give these visions. And following of these visions, some time later, uh, OVE40 was Born and OVE40, the name is the German Ortsverband, it's uh, the district, the DOK, and India 40 is uh, uh, our DOK, that's the name. And uh, how to spell it, uh, I don't know at the moment. I think we will not talk it OVI because in German uh, it's not always a very positive word. OVI40. Uh, OVI40 uh, includes ideas. Uh, which were uh, coming up uh, in the discussion groups uh, as we wanted to work with MCHF. It was a German discussion group, mainly uh, at the starting a German discussion group, uh, and uh, within half a year uh, there were about 500 members uh, which are building MCHFs and uh, uh, who want uh, to improve uh, MCHF hardware and software. Software at this, pro at this moment was a problem uh, because uh, there is not, uh, version not a versioning system and only one person was uh, actively working on the firmware. Uh, it was Clint, KA7 Oscar Echo India. Many thanks to Clint. He has made a very good base uh, at this time, but there was no possibility of contribution. 
Uh, and so that this was my work uh, to start a contributing system, open source, which can develop uh, in any direction you can imagine. OVE40 is a project uh, that wants to be open completely in software and hardware. That means uh, there are no restrictions that uh, it is not uh, for commercial use or so. Uh, in, uh, in software, in firmware, uh, any uh, regressions uh, would it make very hard to implement other parts. For example, from, from Warren, which are under GNU GPL. GNU GPL is uh, the open source license and uh, we have put uh, the hardware of uh, OVE40 to CERN OHL, that is open hardware layer, and it is uh, similar to uh, the software side GNU GPL. Uh, the hardware uh, will be available uh, for buying uh, bare PCBs or kits which contain all parts, and later uh, there may be uh, possibilities of getting partially or complete soldered uh, devices. MCHF actually has the problem uh, that it uh, is uh, not available from Chris for complete devices. Uh, the parts are described only by um, the technical specifications, no part numbers. Uh, it will work from a few kilohertz up to 250 megahertz, Eric's. Uh, TX, same range, the same range, but uh, 160 meters to 2 meters, it will have a 74 watt output, and outside this range, uh, only 50 milliwatt for drivers. Uh, it has low power consumption to be a standalone and a very small design. This is the design. Uh, signals uh, want to be as clean as possible with this uh, very easy technique. Uh, it can be uh, Sometimes it was uh, a little bit better uh, for giving some oils more, uh, so not uh, the low cost is the uh, standard, but the best signal. It, is, it wants to be uh, built as a modular system, uh, so if you want to build one uh, and you want to improve it, you have not to change the complete project, but only the, the um, module. Two main parts. One is uh, the computing unit, and the computing unit contains the F7 or H7 processor. It handles all which has to do with computing, LCD, keyboard, encoders, and so on. It has optional RAM and flash and an SD card where, where you can put uh, data and USB plugs for uh, updating firmware, for connecting uh, audio and cut, and so on. RFPCB will be one motherboard and all these blocks you see will be plugged as modules and can later be uh, swapped uh, if there are better or newer solutions available. The MCU uh, at this moment is F7, H7 is not available because STM must revise the hardware. It has some more push buttons and uh, encoders have push buttons too. It is uh, capable of, of driving uh, larger displays than MCHF. Actually, we have uh, 3.5 inch uh, with uh, 480, 200, uh, 320 uh, resolution. This uh, is the placement, the time is too, uh, too low to go through every point. You can see it later. And I will plug only one module which um, is representative uh, for the design. Uh, we have uh, a, mixing pro a mixing project, uh, so we take SE5351A and uh, get output 90 degree from uh, 3.2 megahertz up to the maximum uh, this uh, oscillator works. 
and uh, we have uh, tested uh, 90 per over 90 percent are working up to 290 megahertz. So two meters is not a problem. Uh, below uh, 3.2 megahertz, uh, we are not uh, capable of uh, getting 90 degree LO from this device, so we must divide it. Uh, division is done by semiconductors which are very, very fast. Potato semiconductors, uh, do not laugh, they exist. It's a small uh, factory in USA and they provide, provide uh, gigahertz uh, uh, TTL logics. The mixer, multiplexer, is a, a gigahertz device too. And so you can, by software, decide if you want uh, to go the way division by four or SE5351. You can compare uh, if a phase is a problem or it, if it is not. You can discuss hours and weeks, but it is here very easy. Just switch and see, you can see the result. This is a very small module which consists everything around RX. And if there is a new, only the module must be changed. Because it is an uh, open source project, we have a hall of fame. Every contributor, and we have now four active which are here sitting. Uh, there is uh, one which is not uh, here at the moment, Ralph, Delta Golf 8, Yankee Golf Whiskey, who designs the first UE PCB, which is uh, already available at the moment. And Slavek, uh, Sierra Papa 9, Bravo Sierra Lima, uh, who uh, has um, uh, built uh, the 3.5-inch LCD and now works at an 800-600 uh, LCD where you can get uh, standard SDR output and digital outputs, for example, uh, FT8 or so, not yet implemented, but I, maybe it's coming, I hope, I'm nearly sure. Airtight Y is working, PSK is working at the moment, and you can see it on one screen. You don't need a PC. It's all integrated. Um, the time is over. I hope there are not so much questions so that we can step on. Many thanks. Any questions? No questions, so we take the next step. So the next is Danilo Boiche, are you? Yes. Yeah, I okay. Am. I hope. Uh, Delta Bravo 4, Papa Lima Echo. He will talk the next step, please. Yes, thanks uh, for joining us after lunch and thanks for Andreas to keep the time. Um, yes, what I will do is uh, Andreas uh, explained a little bit about the new hardware we have and I represent uh, the software part of it, and uh, this is where the UHSDR comes into. Uh, I don't know who knows what UHSDR is, if it is spelled out. No one? Well, then you should look up. Uh, the internet, it's the universal HAM, HAM uh, software-defined radio firmware. This is, uh, this is what drives um, a number of things, and this is uh, the, uh, our place where we work. And what this is, is the amount of software we contribute. Uh, we have contributed over, well, this, this period. Um, and you can see we are active. Now it's April, June, May. That's not so active every year. Uh, so we actually recently got complaints of not doing anything. This is not true. We are here and we do something. Um, what this, this software is not, is the software which runs on, a multiple, uh, on multiple devices. So we have, of course, the MCHF. We have uh, uh, from Helmut uh, from Austria uh, a nice small package uh, where he changed a little bit of the hardware. The software is the same. Uh, we have another interpretation which is really, really, really small of this one, small device from Artur um, from Poland. And of course, we have the OV40, uh, which takes this uh, to the next level by changing the CPU. All of these run the same software from the same source, we have to say. Um, and um, 
the, the trick for this one was to decide how we want to do that project. You know, many, many software projects are like, you know, the next thing and you forget about the old one. But we had with MCHF, we had about 1,000 or more users out there. Uh, and, and part of my goal in that project was to have that support for them for a very long time. So we're not just throwing away the, the, the old stuff and letting them alone, but whatever we can fit into the old device will go there and the new ones will do more. We will see that. In a, uh, in, uh, in a moment. And the, the problem for us is we want to have more contributors and we, fi we figured out that not everyone is a, is a computer scientist, which you should be in theory, uh, and also a, a mathematician and whatnot. So we have a, a quite diverse range. Uh, I myself am a computer scientist um, and the others may say what they are if they want, uh, but they are not computer scientists, I can tell you that much. So. Um, there were a few things uh, which, we, which we basically decided um, that we use a simple programming language. C, it's not a good one, but it's simple. The original software was written in this one, so we kept this. We have a very well-maintained built environment, so you can download it, follow the instructions, and you will be, will be able to run the software and build it and change it. This is very important. We got really good reports on this one. Um, and we try to keep the code readable which is also a challenge if you want to do high performance stuff. For those who have been written, written some pieces in assembly know what I'm talking about. Uh, this is very high performance, but really bad for others to understand what you're doing there, let alone the DSP stuff anyway, even in C for me, uh, incomprehensible. So um, the other thing we did is to make it easy, and that, uh, easy and simple is that we try to make uh, things which happen often during the evolution of a system as easy as possible. So to add a new entry to our menu system, you write like uh, three to 10 lines of code and then you have even a help text which is automatically put up to our web page um, so that someone can look up what the menu entry is for. Uh, if you want to save something in, uh, consistently over time and you switch it off, it's one line of code you have to write or one line of definition you have to write. And then we test every submission automatically, everything is built. So these things make it possible for our small team to accept contributions from the outside. Everyone can try if it works for, for himself uh, and contribute, which is important for an open source software project. Um, and of course, uh, I do as mentioned this, we are GPL v3, so we can use Warren's stuff with uh, the, the former licenses. This was unfortunately not possible uh, if we would have been uh, you know, compliant with the uh, licenses. So now we are. Uh, that was an important step. And of course, we use GitHub. Everything happens on GitHub. You can see what I do in my GitHub, and then it, sometimes it goes uh, to the other one. So last but not least, the moment you have been waiting for, what platforms we do we support? And Andreas mentioned it, STM is the only platform we do right now, because a lot of the stuff is high performance stuff and we benefit from the processors are similar, not identical. So we have uh, a number of uh, processors using the HAL library. For those who have been programming STM, there's a lot of debate about using a, a generated code and HAL libraries. For us, it's the time saver because we run the same code on top uh, of three processors mostly uh, due to that. So, um, what do we do? The ar software architecture is fairly simple. So we have uh, signal processing, uh, taking data from a codec, and we, uh, we run, uh, well, we don't have the power the other guys had before us, unfortunately. So we have just uh, 48K samples. Um, uh, we uh, we uh, produce some data, and we send it to another codec, which then gives us the audio on the device somewhere here. Um, we have the same architecture on the, on the, the other side. Uh, that means for the TX processing, we get audio data. Uh, we put it through some DSP processing and we uh, shift it out of a codec. And then the all uh, RF hardware takes care of mixing it up to uh, the right frequency. Um, and then we have control code. This is the, this is the DSP stuff here, right? Uh, and then we have control code, and uh, which, which controls the clock generators, uh, the bandpass filter settings, uh, re some relays, display keys, and also USB audio and CAT control, uh, all integrated. So this is all running there. Uh, and it, this is based on, on, well, that's control software. And the architecture uh, of that system is pretty simple. 
So we have all of the signal processing runs in an interrupt. And for those who know what this means, uh, we, I will show you a few slides what that means for those who don't. Uh, and then all the control code runs in a, what is called a big fat main loop. It's a very simple thing where we do one thing after the other and uh, there's nothing fancy in that. And that creates a number of problems, uh, especially looking at the hardware. For those who have a PC at home, um, we have 168 megahertz as the lowest frequency and uh, 192K RAM, that is no mistake. Uh, that is K. Uh, so no one mega sample FFT uh, in that thing. Um, <laughs> yes, okay. Not m I, I don't have much time, so I will, I will explain you what, uh, what the challenge is. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, processing IQ data in, IQ data out, and you can see this is the processing time it takes to run the DSP in interrupt, and this is the processing time which remains for all the buttons and so forth. In that architecture, if the, the processing time for samples goes longer than that one, nothing happens anymore on that device. Um, and we are talking 600, uh, 600 microseconds here. And uh, this, this red part goes up to 90% on the F4. So, uh, and the challenge with that is if we do things like 3DV, FFT, and so forth, uh, we cannot really push, uh, do it in uh, 600 microseconds anymore in one go. We cannot split it up. Uh, we have no operating system which does all of that nice work. So what we did is we pushed that into another interrupt which allows us to run the long running DSP processing at lower priority. <laughs> and so it blocks all the UI code uh, for, well, in, in case of 3DV, 11 uh, milliseconds. Uh, so it's only audio in, audio out, and uh, DSP processing, no buttons pressing, no nothing. But it keeps the whole thing very simple and it's a simple evolution from the existing architecture. If we would do it new, we would do it better. Uh, but this is the trick to keep all the stuff running without breaking anything. So, um, some software features. We decided to use a CAT protocol. It's FT817, probably also FT8118. Um, uh, so this behaves like a normal FT117 uh, uh, if you connect it to USB. Well, you don't have to have a serial cable. And we have USB audio. We have two display sizes. We have different processors. H7 was mentioned. I have one and it's not working, uh, working well and we don't know if it's the processor or if we are too stupid to do that. So we have digital modes built in with decoders, RTT, PSK and of also CV, yes, I see. Uh, I have to look at Frank if he kills me. Uh, or, okay, and uh, we do some other stuff like digital voice, that is the most interesting thing. We squeeze the 3DV into this thing as well. Um, and that is the max we can do on the F4 hardware on F7, which comes up now. What I want to do, what we, what we get as requests, what is to be done, memories, 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 more data to be saved when you switch bands. Filters, we, don't, we have fixed filters now, and the guys after me will talk about what we are probably going to do later on that stuff. Uh, more modes, Seven, uh, 700D is now the new thing I'm working on. Uh, wasn't able to fix that for today. Um, extensibility makes a new challenge in software, changing the modules uh, and still, you know, the receiver knows what is going on. We made the provisions in hardware, we have to extend the software to keep, keep up with that. And last but not least, uh, the STM H7, which drives me crazy because we can't get USB to work on this thing. Um, not the, the, the sideband thing, uh, the one with the PC. And uh, Atos maybe in future, but not now, too difficult for us. And uh, automation and testing is also a big thing to scale this thing up. And last but not least, and that's why I'm here, more developers who want to contribute to that nice small project. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Do you think the RAM is big enough? Well, uh, that is, that is a, yeah, no, uh, not on the F4. Um, the F4 is, uh, we, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't think I have it on the slide. We are like 120% uh, over at uh, the F4. Uh, so we squeeze that to 100%. Uh, there is nothing left. Whatever we add, 
uh, we have to take some, um, something else else out. Uh, so to save RAM, 3DV is a bad, is a killer. It's 40k for us. Um, that is a lot of 192. Um, but the new ones have like half a meg, or even a meg. Uh, the the H7 has up to one mega RAM. So we can do. An, a few more things like F larger FFTs and all of that stuff, and they have a huge amount of horsepower uh, to spend. Uh, how long will you still support the original MCHF? That is a very good question. We said as long as there is su sufficient interest and support from the community for doing so. So there is no plan to discontinue that. Uh, the first step we did, uh, which some of you who use that have seen, is that due to the RAM, to the flash size restrictions, we, we offer two variants uh, of the of the MCHF software. One is uh, fits into half a meg of flash, and the other one needs more. Uh, and so we leave, will leave out some functionality out of the small devices, but the functionality which you see today and also a few more things which we improve will go into the even in the, into the small one if possible. And maybe we will come at some point to a breaking point, but there is no, no current plan to kind of let this alone. One of our goals is to keep that thing running. That is part of the game we play. How long can we squeeze you know, something out of this one uh, so that it will still do the job? FT8, the experts have to say that. I don't think it's going to work on the F4. More questions? No? Then? Ah, there was one. Uh, what are the deve development tools uh, in circuit emulation, yes or no? Well, um, uh, we have support for, we, we, well, I at, at least use real-time debugging, uh, of course, otherwise I wouldn't get to the point of finding, finding out what is, go what is going wrong. We use uh, uh, automated build processes on Linux. We have the Eclipse IDE running on Linux and Windows. Uh, we even have some other strange uh, IDE I have never heard before, which we do support. Um, but the main tools are uh, the Eclipse IDE for those who prefer to work in a, uh, in a graphical IDE and for the, for the automation and for some other Linux guys, uh, we have the command line build, which we also use for testing and this kind of thing. So it's, it's pretty standard. We use GCC as a compiler. Um, for those who are interested, uh, we use the kubemx generated code from, from the STM. That is a tool which allows you to define the hardware and the processor mappings to pins. To a certain degree, it, uh, it frees us from thinking about how uh, the USB stack, from, for instance, this we use uh, from them. Um, but it's pretty standard stuff, I would say. So I think we have to close the questionnaires now <laughs> to get the next step. The next step will be uh, hold by Frank. Uh, Frank will talk about... language I'm a biologist but I'm very interested in uh, digital signal processing and very interested in, in ham radio so I, I started with the help with the excellent help of, of these guys in, in our team I started to dig uh, a little bit into the digital signal processing and together with Michael we would like to present you the core of what's going on in digital signal processing in UH SDR software <laughs> Well, of course, we have the uh, audio path for receive where we have the, the different filtering, the main filtering and everything, the demodulation that's being done. Uh, we have uh, digital decoding at the moment. We have a Morse decoder implemented. We have uh, RTTY uh, decoding. We have PSK and Michael will talk about in more detail about uh, the FreeDV Codec 2 uh, speech uh, decoding and encoding. Uh, of course, we have a real-time spectrum display, a real-time waterfall display, uh, which is uh, on the screen. And from these displays, uh, which uh, produce, which calculate an, an FFT, we also have these um, uh, derived S-meter uh, readings and the DBM uh, display. Um, 
Michael has programmed an impulse noise blanker based on linear predictive coding, uh, similar to the one that was programmed by Warren Pratt in the WDSP uh, library. We have a spectral noise reduction with a, a simplified Ephraim Mala um, uh, algorithm, because the original algorithm, of course, uh, does not run on such a small um, processor that, that we have. And I would like to um, um, briefly introduce two functions, the snap carrier function, so a function where you can snap to an AM carrier, um, um, which is a, quite a nice thing, which can also be used to tune to a CW signal so that you are exactly on the frequency of your QSO partner. And that's a nice thing. And of, of course, we have DSP and the order path for transmit and for the digital encoding uh, when you transmit. So these are the things that we will be talking about. I will introduce first the audio path and uh, Michael will talk about the, the speech codec 3DV and the impulse noise blanker and I will uh, talk a little about the noise reduction, the snap carrier function, the CW tune uh, function. So we have the INQ, INQ signals coming from the hardware and uh, these are um, going into uh, fr uh, modified from integrate to float. We have an automatic IQ phase and amplitude correction in the software, so you don't have to manually adjust. Uh, it's a, the, a simple algorithm by Mosley and Slump, uh, which we have implemented. We have frequency translation, uh, which we have already uh, seen that we have to do to get the audio signal in the baseband. We have a 12 kilohertz intermediate frequency that we're using, uh, so that's the sample rate. Uh, divided by four, so it's very simple to just multiply with the scene and cosinus uh, wave uh, to do that. And then, of course, we have to decimate to do all the processing with that small uh, processor. We decimate by four, so we are in uh, 12 kilosamples per second. We have the, the standard Hilbert transform uh, for SSB demodulation and CW demodulation or uh, low-pass filters, uh, linear phase low-pass filters for AM. Uh, and we have the demodulation, and we also have a stereo mode, so you can listen to your INP, INQ signals uh, directly, or you listen to USB with your right ear and LSB with your left ear, for those who like this. But that's only possible with uh, the hardware, uh, with the new hardware, because the MCHF does not accommodate for stereo uh, uh, audio channels. We have a standard uh, LMS auto-notch filter, and the main filtering is being done by an IIR filter. It's a 10th order IIR uh, filter that we have. And we have the excellent AGC taken from the WDSP uh, library again. So that's working very nicely. And if we switch in, if you switch in the noise blanker or the spectral noise reduction, we have to do another decimation because that takes so much processing time. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you only need signals from uh, zero to uh, three kilohertz. So six um, kilo samples per second sample rate is uh, enough for doing noise blanking and uh, noise reduction. Then we have to interpolate uh, uh, again and uh, we have another anti-alias filter to, to filter out the alias aliasing. We have scaling and conversion from flow to integer and uh, finally the DAC and the codec so we have our uh, nice audio, so a standard um, audio path that we have here. You see that we have filtering in the time domain um, and I will talk about what we are planning to do uh, later on. This is the snap function to tune to your carrier. Uh, you can see here uh, the output from the display, spectrum display FFT. These are the bins, and this is the magnitude that you can see on the y-axis. And uh, what the, the algorithm does, if you press a button, snap to that carrier, it simply looks for the largest signal and then it looks for the bin that is nearest to this largest signal and takes the lower bin and the upper bin above that. And then it uh, does a simple three-bin quadratic interpolation to estimate the carrier frequency from these spectrum display results that's being described, has been described by in this uh, nice paper. And it was astonishingly accurate. So we can uh, estimate the carrier and then fine-tune the local oscillator uh, up to an accuracy of one to three hertz. And this is also done when you have a CW signal. So you have this little uh, sign here, and you have to adjust uh, your CW signal so that this little yellow uh, stripe goes exactly in the middle, and then you're exactly on the CW frequency of your QSO partner. That, on that only works when in the background there's a Morse activity detector that's being uh, that has been implemented in the uh, CW decoder. 
so it looks whether there's a, s a signal present, and if there's a signal present, then you have the, the data to estimate your carrier. That w works uh, very nicely with an accuracy of 5 to 10 hertz, about uh, something like this. Um, this is uh, the scheme uh, of the spectral noise reduction. So we have, uh, do we don't, we have an LMS auto-notch filter, but we have a spectral noise reduction here because it works better for signals that have a very low uh, signal-to-noise ratio. LMS noise reduction works very good for large signals, but if you have a low SNR, uh, it's better to have spectral noise reduction. So we take the samples, and we've heard about windowing today before. We have heard about overlapping. So we take 128 <coughs> samples as an input, and we take 128 samples uh, from the last um, um, time event. We have a square root von Hen window windowing, and we calculate uh, an FFT with 256 points, we, because we, we can't uh, calculate a million points <laughs> with our processor. Um, and we get uh, information for 128 frequency bins, because we have a real signal, or real audio signals. And then we have to estimate the noise that's present in the bins. And there's a very nice algorithm by Gergmans and Hendricks, which has a, this minimum mean square estimate, estimator with a, um, a calculation uh, um, with a soft uh, speech presence probability calculation. So it looks whether there's speech present because if we want to estimate the noise, uh, we don't want to estimate it in, uh, at the time when there is speech present. So we have to make a decision in software whether there's a speech present or not. And this is very nice. So we have the noise estimates. And from these estimates, we can estimate SNRs. And from these SNRs, we can calculate gains. So these 128 bins are multiplied with these calculated gains uh, in order to uh, decrease the noise and um, to, uh, to um, have a higher um, SNR ratio to uh, suppress the noise that we have. And Michael programmed a very nice musical noise reduction by dynamic averaging. I think that was also inspired by uh, what is done in, in WDSB. Um, and we go from the frequency domain into the time domain again by uh, calculating the inverse FFT and doing the standard overlap and add, and hopefully then we have the audio signal with the noise reduced. And uh, before giving the microphone to Michael, maybe we can try to hear something. <laughs> Und deswegen die Farbe da, ich nehme an, dass die FCG, ich wollte schon Rollverfahren, aber ich habe es vergessen, ob, da, ob die DSC da drauf waren oder was jetzt. Da müssen die bestimmt denn die, die Filter umgehen und, und äh, schalten, wenn die Filter sind, dann hast du die beiden Seiten dann da. So you get the point of, of why, we, why we do this. So, yeah. I would propose that we, uh, that we continue with uh, Michael directly and uh, you can then uh, pose your questions afterwards on the digital time enough. processing. It's time enough for the question, if there is one. Do we have any questions at the moment? Yeah, okay. Uh, you said, I heard you have uh, FT, 870 functionality, more or less. Do you have um, a better noise reduction? Do you have uh, better cost? Myself, I personally, I don't own any commercial ham radio uh, transceiver, so I can't uh, answer that question. But this noise reduction is uh, better than the standard LMS noise reduction that you have on, on many transceivers. And it's, it is, com and we also, of course, we also compared this to the, the commercial products by BHI and there are others um, and it's really similar it's really similar 
we think, but it's very, also very subjective. Uh, if you like, it, there is a an, an distortion in the sound, of course. If you have a very high amount of, of reducing the noise with noise reduction, even with these nice algorithms with the spectral noise reduction, you will have distortion. And it's up to you to decide, um, well, what do I want? Do I want a, a little more hissing sound and accept that for, for and have less distortion? Or do I want to completely reduce my hissing sound, completely reduce the noise? and have a, a little bit of distorted signal. That's, that's up to you. So, so I won't really do a commercial for our noise reduction or for other noise reduction. It's really subjective. Okay, so... Ah, there's one more question. A moment. Uh, if this noise reduction is effective to a, a without signal, uh, just like a scarcity. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I get, got the, the question right. Is it yeah. uh, this noise reduction is effective for a without a signal. Without signals, you have is, it, it, it is effective for, for a, a non-existing signal if you only have a, a hissing sound, but you can hear the artifacts. It's like a little waterfall. But it's not, not as annoying as uh, LMS noise reduction, where you really have the sound of like someone shouting in a tube or, or something like this. So, but, but also, um, it depends on your, your personal, um, yeah, on your, on your subject, on the subjective perception of sound that you have. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Frank. <laughs> and we go further with uh, Michael. Okay, thanks a lot, Frank, for handing over to me. Um, Danilo, I'm also no software ex expert, so thank you very much for taking care of my code. Um, so 3DB and digital uh, or imp impulse noise reduction, why did we choose this combination? It sounds a bit funny, but I hope you will notice why we, we, we did it during my talk here. So um, why are we, all, are we looking for digital voice modes? Of course we are targeting for less signal-to-noise ratios necessary than with SSB. And also, we are looking for lower bandwidth necessary than for SSB so that we can pook, uh, pack more QSOs in our band. And of course, it's much fun to experiment with those new kind of uh, modes. So the challenges are always bitrate and bandwidth. When we look in the past, we had uh, ISDN, very popular in Germany for telephone transmission. It has 64 kilobit. The audio spectrum is similar to our SSB spectrum, that, but they had 64 kilobit. We won't fit that in our, into our SSB channel. Also MP3, it has a high compression, of course high fidelity, very good audio, almost no um, artifacts in there. So, but also 64 kilobits, and higher than 64 kilobits, so that, that would, only, would also not fit into our channel. Then we have the commercial stuff like MELP or MB. Michael already talked about MB, so MB is, is under license, so we are doing open software, open SDR, so we don't want to integrate an MB chip in our <laughs> transceiver. And then um, it was David Rowey in <coughs> Australia which came up with a free DB, which is open open software, and it is far below 2,400 bits per second, and it includes uh, several hundred bits of error correction to make, it, make us able to transmit over a channel which is influenced by, of course, by high um, fading, and also mul multiple propagation with high time delays between the different propagation set channels, and what we want to do, although we compress to 2,400 bit per second and even lower now, the 700D has 700 bit per second, we want to sound as natural as possible, which is sometimes <laughs> not very clear when you listen to the signals. And we want to notice who is talking, and of course, also the emotions of the speaker should be transmitted. So how does it work? Now we have to go to the very analog side of uh, speech. When we look at how speech is produced, this is, this is a cross cut of you know, my head, maybe. So, what is, 
What happens? The air is coming up here through our larynx and then there are the vocal folds. The vocal folds actually are producing a sawtooth-like um, um, signal. It's an audio signal and, and, and if you would take a microphone and go down here, then it really sounds awful. It's a, like a sawtooth wave when you have an audio generator and turn on sawtooth, it sounds very awful. But that is really what we are doing here when we are sp speaking or when we are singing at the very point there, it's very annoying. But then we have the oral cavity, the vocal fo uh, the, the, the tongue and our nasal cavity and the shape of this actually filters the sawtooth wave and we get our vocals, A, E, I, O, U. And the lip, that's funny lips there, oops, sorry, that shouldn't happen. <laughs> the lips here, they are actually doing the impedance transformation from our inner impedance and the outer impedance. That's true, it's, it's really an impedance transmission and uh, yeah. So, how does 3DV work? So, 3DV constantly looks at your signal and it tries to calculate a model of what you are doing in your head. So, first of all, it um, models the sawtooth wave and then every 40 milliseconds it builds a filter. Here for free digital voice we take a 10 pole filter and every 40 milliseconds it calculates the, this tube model, um, the diameter of each tube. It's actually a 10 pole filter and it calculates the coefficients of this filter. So what we have to do with free digital voice, we have to take care of the pitch every 10 milliseconds because we can change the pitch very, fa uh, very fast. Uh, every 10 milliseconds we have to monitor that. But the mechanical apparatus in our head is very slow, so it's enough to look at, uh, at this every 40 milliseconds. Um, we come up with the 10-pole filter, we evaluate the 10 coefficients of this filter, and then, of course, do this in this time, and then we transmit those coefficients, the basic frequency of the sawtooth wave, and the volume to our receiver. The challenge in Sierra, this process, modeling it, it, takes a lot of CPU load and, of course, it needs much memory. And that's what we yeah, stumbled across when I tried to port that. It crashed due to memory and CPU load. And then, of, of course, we had Danilo and he fixed many problems in 3DV. So the effi efficient way, uh, I will um, look at this very briefly, to calculate um, this model is LPC analysis. So during my talk we will stumble about LPC about 10 times. LPC stands for linear predictive coding and of course we can use this in the time domain and the frequency domain. Here we start with the frequency uh, domain. Um, we do this analysis by a multiple auto correlation and f uh, after that the Levinson Durbin algorithm which solves a 10 by 10 linear equation and finally we get our 10 uh, coefficients here. You can write this filter function like this or yeah, that is better notice noticeable in a block graph like this. So when we, when we have this filter we can just uh, apply our sawtooth wave to this filter and we, we produce the speech on the receiver side. That's how it works. Of course nobody would really generate a sawtooth wave in our SDR transceiver. Now we know we have a basic fundamental frequency and within 2.4 kilohertz we have five, six or seven harmonics and we just weigh those harmonics by our filter function and then add all the sinusoidals to get our speech. What we have to notice here, our apparatus here in our head, it can produce any kind of speech, we can sing, but we never can produce impulsive noise here. So this kind of generator can never ever produce impulsive noise. That's important for when we talk about the noise blanker later on. The problem we have on noise blanking is that we actually want to transmit in a vocal like A here. It is undistorted. These are 128 samples in our MECAF and actually they are taken from the MECAF back to the PC and um, 21 milliseconds <coughs> of signal. So, but, but then, many times near to the receiver, the signal is hit by some impulses here and here. 
They are very small, but actually they are very annoying when you are listening, listening in, a, in a QSO to, you, to your partner and you have some small distortions, they are really annoying. So what we first to do is, have to do is, we have to find all the impulses in the current frame. Next, we have to estimate the original signal in the uh, distorted sections. And last but not least, we have to replace the distorted uh, parts with an estimation of the original signal. So, how is it done? I talked about the LPC coefficients. So we can use these, these co coefficients, the LPC coefficients, in many different ways. So now we are not talking about 3 dB. Now we are at standard SSB reception and we calculate the LPC coefficients every 40 milliseconds from the signal we receive. It's like looking from far to our signal, calculate the LPC coefficients, which are a model of the current speech coming from the transmitter, but this, this model will just neglect the impulses. So when we have calculated this model, we take the inverse filter. You saw the filter function, it's very easy. You just take the denominator and then you have the inverse filter. And then we pass our signal through this filter and what we reject is the vocal. So this, this sound is now somehow speechless. It's just, yes, the sawtooth wave, which you might see down here, and the impulses. And the impulses are already enhanced. And then, again, you can use the LPC coefficients and just you reverse the order. And by re reversing the order of the LPC filter, or of the LPC coefficients, you get a matched filter, which is, um, which is um, really focusing on delta impulses, very sharp, infinite impulses. And you see, this filter enhances the impuls impulses even more. And what we then do is we just calculate the average power of this signal here and calculate a dynamic threshold and at every place where this remaining signal hits the threshold, we are having an impulse. In our case, those impulses at, are at 45 and 67 in our signal. So, what we do now is, we, we now know exactly where our impulse is. I zoomed into the signal here. So first of all, we erase this distorted area. So, and then, again, we use the LPC filter. Now we come to the, to the, the, the name of LPC, Linear Predictive Coding. So we can use those coefficients to predict the signal, the future signal, by looking at the past samples. So we have here eight or nine samples, and we feed some of those into a forward predictor made just from a multiplication of our LPC coefficients with each of the sample. Adding them together, we get one predicted sample here. And then we move our forward predictor, just one sample, take the new one in, take the first sample of the original signal out, and we can predict the next sample. And so we move on through our erased area, and we get the first set of predicted samples. You can imagine, the more far I go to the right, the more incorrect is the prediction. But what we also have, we have the samples in the past, just on the right side of our, our distorted area. And by, again, using the LPC coefficients, reversing them and negate the coefficients, we build it a backward predictor. And so, so we do the same again, going from right to left and creating a second set of samples from the future samples. And then we just do a weight averaging, so we weigh the samples close to our predictor with 100% and the more far I go to right or left, we just take, it's like a triangular function. Then we add them up, yes, and we, had our, we have our weight average and we can insert the predicted samples or the somehow original samples. So that's how our impulse noise blanker works. It's uh, much easier than yours because we have not so much um, CPU power and not so much memory, 
We are actually working with uh, just a tenth order LPC, uh, but it works, works pretty well. So this, this, is, this is the block diagram about how we do it. We have the, usually the, the signal traveling just through our signal reconstruction. And if the parallel working LPC analysis and this filter function detects some impulses, <coughs> we just switch here from the original signal, the understood, undistorted signal, in cases where we find some impulses. So, that's all. So, are there any questions to the both last speakers? I have two, yeah, I have two more slides uh, for the outlook. So, oh, shall, okay. I, shall I do that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We have two more slides for uh, the future of the project. So, we first look at these slides. Explain yeah. them. I just have two more two more slides, uh, two minutes. What uh, are the plans for the future? You've seen all this time um, time domain uh, filtering, and we of course would like to rebuild the whole filtering uh, to the frequency domain filtering. So doing fast convolution filtering, as we have heard uh, today several times, uh, so we don't have to use IIR uh, filtering and uh, uh, doing overlap. Uh, safe filtering for that. Um, maybe it would be possible when I saw in the program low, this low lat latency uh, filtering, maybe it uh, would be nice to uh, introduce that, but I'm not sure uh, how complicated that is and, and uh, how, well, if we are capable of doing that. So um, I'm uh, not so sure about this. Uh, I think this would be very easy to implement, controlled envelope C SSB for transceive, so to have a higher efficiency for SSB, which is especially important for a QRP trans, um, transceiver as we have. And I was very happy to hear about this, this phase rotation, and I have to look into that, and maybe we can talk about that, so maybe that's another possibility to um, increase the efficiency of uh, transmission on an SSB. And I, I found a very old paper from the 1980s uh, for an op automatic tune algorithm for SSB, so you don't have this Mickey Mouse speech, uh, so it automatically tunes, but it needs some seconds to tune to, so whether this is a, a way to really use it in real time, I don't know, but um, when I have spare time, um, maybe um, we can see well, we can do something like this. And I wanted to point you to the wiki. We also have a wiki on our homepage on GitHub, so you can read about um, many of the things that have been presented on the um, structure of the firmware on our wiki. And of course, this is the most important thing, uh, the acknowledgements. Uh, we, we have to thank so many people in the whole community, especially Chris and Clint, for their approval to put the software in the public domain. So that's, uh, that was the main point. Uh, to integrate other public domain software parts and also to all the contributors uh, to, to, uh, and also to all the others who wrote really nice software, uh, Qt SDR, uh, WDSB for Rick Lyons for his uh, very nice book, Anders Retzler for the CSDR library. We've also taken parts of uh, the code from that and also the, the seminal papers by Gerald Youngblood and uh, Leif Asbrink and Alberto gave a very nice hint uh, um, on, a, on a mistake in, this, in the firmware. And all the, all the people from the forum, all the testers, uh, and this is the main part, the most important part, the testers who give us the feedback and, and that's very nice. So we, we are able to um, have the whole community contribute on, on these things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have only a very short time for questions. Are there any questions? Okay, yeah. Thank you. So my question is partially answered by you, and that was, which areas you expect uh, the community to contribute back to the project? Well, um, at the moment, uh, uh, the main thing we're working on uh, is the RF hardware, and we have to put that uh, into uh, functioning um, 
I won't give any dates now, no. <laughs> um, but also in the, in the software, we would have to um, um, make several things, as you have seen, the filtering that has to be rebuilt and uh, for the new software where things have to be arranged, <coughs> such for these pluggable modules, which uh, Andreas will, um, will have on the RF platform. So there are several things which are going on. Um, where the community at the moment can probably not contribute uh, so much, but that will, be, will become better when the RF uh, PCB is ready and when we're then ready to start up on that platform and to improve the software on that basis. Or do you have other ideas, things that we have to prepare? I think for the software side, I already said uh, that there are many, many areas where, where someone can work and it's, a, it's an open source, basically spare time project of all of us. So uh, there are many areas and you just can ask, I have experience in this and that one, like the guys in DSP, but there's also the real time operating system porting. If there's someone who wants to do that, uh, that would be great. It takes a lot of time and work and, and, and so forth. So there are many areas. And also usability, it's, that's an issue for all of us. So many functions we could squeeze into and we don't know how to do that. And someone who tries out how this works best with the buttons and touch screen and whatnot, that takes a lot of time and thinking. So there are really a, a lot of areas. You don't have to be a DSP specialist. You can see me, I have no idea what this is about. Uh, and I can still contribute to that project. Uh, so. Um, digital modes, right? Uh, that is a fascinating, fascinating thing, uh, starting with RTTY and then going up to the more interesting thing we heard that FT8 may be something uh, we should look into when we want to have more uh, users of that uh, device. Okay, thank you very much. So we want to